focus today on learning a little bit about how to renovate a property effectively. So uh, today we have uh, Will Bernard uh, and Darius on the line that is actually going to be talking. Uh, they're, they're actually contractors and investors themselves. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking a lot about, you know, the ins and outs of construction, uh, how to actually do it correctly and how to do it from an investor's perspective as well, which I think is extremely important to understand. And, uh, you know, there's there's different rehabs you do for your own house versus from an investment property perspective and different challenges that you face as you go through, you know, uh, this process on any renovation. And I think it's important because, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I've lost a ton of money from, you know, construction jobs going over and issues from subcontractors and, and things like that in the past that, you know, can cause major headaches, especially when you're dealing with a market like, you know, California or something where, you know, you guys do a lot of stuff in California, right? Yeah, everything pretty much. Okay. Darius, you do too. Where, where about, Darius, can you, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself and uh, what you do and, um, uh, and and maybe what, and also what market you primarily focus on? Uh, my, I'm a general contractor. I have a boutique construction company in West Los Angeles. My activity is basically high-end stuff in West LA area. And I've been in the business uh, in construction industry for over 35 years. I started as a hands-on handyman and learned hands-on in the field and eventually grow up to become what I have become. Okay. That's cool, man. You know, I, I can tell you from, from my experience, it is extremely hard to find someone that knows what they're doing, that's reliable, that actually can get the job done right and keep the numbers right and things like that. So uh, it's, it's interesting having someone like your experience coming in, you know, and helping with this, with this presentation and just talking with people about it. So thanks a lot for doing that, man. My pleasure. Uh, what about yourself, Will? Well, I've been investing for over a decade and flipping uh, here locally since 2009 here in Southern California. So, uh, okay. yes, yeah, since 2009 I've been flipping houses. And where, where do you focus for the most part? So, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in San Fernando Valley, Santa Clarita Valley, which back in the day, uh, I, I live in Santa Clarita. So, I'm in the valley. I'm around in and out of L.A. and then I've gone all the way out to Malibu, Beverly Hills, done a uh, multi-million dollar homes. I've done your basic, you know, three bedroom, two bath homes and everything in between. Okay. What, what's the last job you're working on? Last job that I've completed or ones I'm working on now? Well, any of them. I'm curious as to what's, what's the most unique one? <laughs> unique one? Uh, probably my my Agora Hills one where I made a million dollars profit on one flip. That's, I'd have to say, it's probably my favorite. I that's mean, a unique down. <laughs> that's a unique one. And not easy to find, especially in this market. Oh, that, man. That was several years ago. What, what I'm doing now today, most of my stuff, I'm at exits of 800,000 to 1.3, 1.4 million. Okay. Uh, those are, those are my, my bread and butter things right now. So I have a project in Sherman Oaks. We just started. We're on the demo port uh, phase. To that, I have a project in Atwater Village. I'm just doing the finish work, and that okay. should hit the market in early August. Okay. Uh, I have another project in Sunland, which is in the, also in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, that one is, uh, and most of these jobs are all adding on. So, like my Sherman Oaks, it's a 1,100 square feet currently. It's going to be 2,000 square feet when I'm done. Okay, and that's you know in this kind of a market, I think it's probably really important to focus on those value add type deals because you know in those additional you know, square footage type type plays because it's the only way you're going to get any real profit right now because the competition is so high for the cookie cutter ones, I would assume, right? No question about it. Trying to get a, a what I would call a lipstick deal where you go in and maybe gut a kitchen and bath and slap some paint and carpet and landscape, those days are pretty much gone and trying to find a spread on that, good luck. Yeah, I can I hear you. What about you, Darius? What's the last deal you're working on, man? The deal I just bought the... Uh... A property in Adams area. Um, it's a single family dwelling. I'm just one of those properties that I'm going to be hanging on. The area is changing. Uh, as far as getting other projects, I don't have anything on the belly. I'm just working, uh, doing improvements for other people, for other uh, investors and uh, homeowners. Okay, okay. Interesting. Um, so, so on those types of deals, are you going through and like when you're helping these homeowners and doing improvements and things like that, um, is, it, is it more profitable when you're dealing with, you know, homeowners or investors or how do you deal with different, 
the different types and how do you price your stuff out? Because I would assume, you know, investors are very, very price driven. You know, you would think homeowners are too, but they're more emotional about it as well, right? So when you're dealing with these different people, how, how do you how do you handle, you know, the switches? Is the, the cost the cost and that's pretty much it? Or how do you how do you bid these things out with these different jobs? It's a very good question. Uh, as far as investors, I uh, classify them in two different categories. One that are experience and their time is value, and they appreciate the uh, promptness, the quality, and they don't question you every step of the way. And if you have other investors that they are working on margins, mm -hmm. team in margins, and they're watching every step of the way, and it's very, very difficult to deal with those people. As far as the regular customers, we have a uh, very similar. Some are uh, very particular, very difficult to work with, and some are very large, and they want the best of the best. And uh, yeah. again, time and um, the, the, um, the quality they're looking for yeah. most come to a picture, and that's how you evaluate. Yeah. Going through the architects, interior designers, are for me has been the best uh, source of uh, getting the most for the buck. Okay, so you so you go through and you basically help you know a homeowner and investor design the whole project and basically take it start to finish um, through the whole process. Is that right? Um, I do that correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. And do you do more flips or do you do more of the um, more of the the, the, the homeowner type? Uh, type jobs for the past since 2009 I've done uh, over 15 flips for myself okay okay, okay. Uh, I already marked this site and so my concentration is it's more homeowners food, food okay. on the table and uh, go after the homeowners architects and uh, that that makes sense okay and, and will you you other than your own flips you also do construction for other other investors and flippers and things like that you focus more on the high end side on that stuff or do you focus more on the you know middle market type stuff and which where's the most margin at for you on that right well that's a multiple level question here so uh, aside from my flips yes i do do construction and project management and I do, uh, I think it's important here to make a distinction, I'm sure Darius will agree with me here, in that there's a, a huge difference between a project manager and a general contractor. And, and they're not one of the same. And there's a lot of general contractors out there that may be very good at what they do, but managing a project from an investor standpoint is not their expertise, and they have no idea what they're doing. So as an investor, you're either the project manager yourself, or you're hiring it out. And to expect a general contractor without that experience to do that is difficult. So what I do is, because I'm an investor myself, I also do project management for other uh, clients who are flippers. And okay. the ones that I've done, I've done mid-range stuff in the valley where the you know the exit prices are half a million, six hundred thousand, and that's just your average three right. bedroom, two bath home in the valley. Uh, and then I've done you know million and a half homes, million dollar homes, uh, and so forth and so on. And then as far as construction with retail, like Darius does, I do bathroom remodels, kitchen remodels, adding on to a house if, if that's what somebody wants. Do all those as side jobs. Okay, interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting talking with you guys about this stuff just because, um, you know, I, I invest full-time out of state. And so I have people that are project managers and general contractors on the ground there that I have them dealing with all this stuff. And I can tell you just renovating my own house being the co the project manager in my own house with my wife too, on top of that, I mean, it's like a full time job. It's ridiculous how much work it really is to just make sure that every sub that you're even your subcontractor, you know, or that your contractor has is there doing their job and doing it the way you want it and things like that. I mean, you would it's a pretty amazing, you know, and, and a lot of these contractors don't know like the timeline involved that you need to have when you're you know, renovating a property and when to buy the material so it's there on time specifically so it doesn't drag out months and, you know, things like that and when to call the inspector and, you know, rush to get that last day done before the inspector comes out and things like that. It's it's crazy. And so 
Um, but I'm, I'm kind of excited because now I get to make fun of contractors all the all I want. You guys, you, guys are gonna, you guys can make all the CPA jokes you want. I'm going to make some contractor jokes. No. But, and I think, I think, you know, really what it comes down to is I'd love to get your guys' take on how a contractor can take advantage of, you know, a, a, a normal flipper or a, a homeowner or something like that. And, you know, how to mitigate that risk for, from, from a, you know, a perspective of an investor or someone that's hiring a contractor or something like that. Um, Darius, can you kind of share with us some of the things that contractors do to, to probably take advantage of people that you would say to watch out for? Uh, the main thing is, uh, number one, they, a lot of investors, they don't have any uh, cushions and they are really strict with the numbers. They see watch HTTV or something they hear uh, they go to <laughs> people they see the the uh, pricing is so much per square foot for the trial work and they assume that's the figure they use it they use that figure but when they hire the let's say home people people to do the trial work the guy comes and says yeah you'll be charged two bucks a square foot but you have a corner there your floor is sloping you have a angled in there and all these modifications the floor. and it just keeps adding up and so that is some things that the uh, uh, inexperienced investor does not count for and a lot of inexperienced contractors on the same on the same boat they throw a number there see if it sticks and then they worry about all the small stuff that happens in the field okay um, they say here's a change order, or hey, I didn't, I didn't account for this, or something along those lines, and it just comes to pay for it. This comes as part of part of the part of the deal, and whenever there's a, any minor changes, they make a big deal out of it. Um, but in general, I think as an investor, you need you need to work with a, a, a good contractor, reputable contractor, and always have a cushion. For, as far as the time frame, as also as far as your, uh, um, don't, don't uh, be uh, stingy and uh, this should cost you this much. Gives you need sometimes to give some room for the contractor to make a little profit, but on the same time he can save you at the end mm -hmm. with the time, uh, with the time fashion, with uh, quality things, with, with a lot of tiny things that you don't count in the beginning but it can become a, yeah. your assets down the road okay so you're saying you're saying basically the cheaper guys are going to have change order after change order after change order on you while if you go to somebody that's quality that you know might be a little bit more expensive up front but includes everything it is fully clear and can get the job done for you then it's a lot easier and to watch out for going cheap because those guys really are cheap in the long run that's, that's part of it. And also when you write, have the contract, spell out as much as possible in details. What they're going to what the quality is going to be, who is going to supply what, quality of the material, don't, not necessarily give a budget or allowance. Right, this, right. This, this is possible. Type of paint, who's manufacturer, uh, you would be, let's say, Benjamin Moore. It's the price from Benjamin Moore ranges from 15 boxes a gallon to 50 bucks a gallon. Depends on okay. the of the paint and things like that. Unless, you know, it depends on the, be as specific as in the beginning, I know what you want in the okay. beginning. And, and that's, I think, really hard for someone that's inexperienced, right? Is to know what paint is good, you know, all of those types of, you know, what specific wood, you know, flooring material to buy, you know, all of those things can, you know, they can be completely off the wall different. You know, it's crazy. I mean, just flooring that is, you know, from Europe versus from China has a totally different, you know, buoyancy and, you know, uh, and can, you know, the flooring from China can have major issues when you're dealing with, um, you know, warping and things like that can have problems with your floors, you know, and so like just that little difference and not knowing something like that could cost you a lot of money. And so, um, you know, I agree with you documenting everything up front in detail in, on every piece of material is probably, you know, pretty important, uh, especially if you're new to understand that stuff. What, Will, what do you think about ways contractors take advantage of, you know, inexperienced investors or, um, 
you know, or, or whole waters? I, I would say, in my estimation, probably the easiest way for for contractors to do that is is throwing out a bid that sounds really good, that's impressive to that investor, and they're oh great, I can get this whole rehab done for thirty five grand. Great, where do I sign? And then in the details of that contract, it's very vague. They're non specific. And then all of a sudden, here comes the change orders. Well, I opened up this wall, and there was this behind it. And again, that that can't happen. I'm not saying that if you, right, you right. you're supposed to tile a bathroom, and they open it up, and there's mold behind there. There's no way the contractor can know that. That's a yeah. clear, legitimate change order. But they're going to come back with you for change orders. Oh well, I didn't include the thin set. I only included the tile. You know, right. look at my contract. So all those change orders can add up. So you got to be very careful about picking the cheapest guy. You got to pick the guy that's that knows what he's doing, and I right. think that's where the project manager comes in, in handy too. Especially if you're a new investor trying to go about it alone. Uh, if it's a small deal, absolutely, that's how I learned. And getting your feet wet and making those mistakes. I mean, if you can, if you yeah. can break even on your first deal and get that experience, do it because that's a great learning lesson. I mean, it costs you anything but time. Uh, but <laughs> as far as trying to scale, and not lose money, you know. <laughs> What's that? I said, even if you can break even and not lose money on that first deal, that's amazing, you know. <laughs> exactly, and even if you lost five or ten, let's let's say you had to come to the table with five or ten grand. Well, th that's oh. like a college education. I mean, that's oh, yeah. that's that's real life. Right. I I wouldn't say, hey, I'm not lost five or ten grand. I got to go out and now. I know what mistakes I made. Now I'm going to not repeat those mistakes on my next one. So change orders are probably the biggest way that contractors can take advantage of unknowing uh, uh, rookie investors. And how, how do you mitigate that risk? What can you do? You know, is it in the contract, or what, what? What can you do as far as documentation, or or what to mitigate those? You know, there there's going to be legit change orders and not legit change orders, right? Because Correct. like you said, with the thing behind the wall, if it's something they didn't know about. There's nothing you can do, you know. Like that's what happens, and it's not necessarily fair to have them just pay for it, you know, unless they sure. tell you this includes all change orders up front, you know. But that means right. they're making a bunch of money off of you too, you know. So exactly. Um, and so, what's your thoughts on how to mitigate that risk? Well, as if you're a rookie, it's it's difficult. So without hiring a, a hired gun like a, pro, a project manager, then mm -hmm. you're probably gonna make some mistakes. You're probably gonna maybe overpay or get taken advantage of. But to protect yourself the best, get everything in writing. Ask questions uh, not only to that contractor but to other contractors, uh, to friends, people, other investors who have dealt with these projects, and say, "Listen, here's the scope of my work. That's number one. Lay out." scope of work if you finish hey, here's my rehab project go walk through it and tell me what it needs it's that's not the general contractor's job to walk through there and decide what you need to do you need to have a scope of work it should say i want to move this this wall over here i want to gut this kitchen remodel it i want shaker cabinets i want granite countertops or i want caesar stone i want this tile backsplash or i want no tile backsplash everything what appliances do you want and then the best Probably the best advice I can give you as a rookie investor is to try and buy all the materials yourself. A, it avoids a little bit of the markup. B, you're shopping, you know exactly what it costs, and you get it there so it's on site. And then the contractor just needs to bring in that labor and and bang it out. So then it's all a matter of timelines. I, I think that mitigates some of the risk for sure with regard to you know um, charging overages on labor and things like that. Um, I mean, on, on materials and you know that kind of thing and that difference. But I, I also think you know having making sure you go to your contractor for you know if you don't if you're a beginning investor and don't have your material sources, make sure you get that contractor's advice on where to go and get the pricing that they get on top of your own pricing. I think that's important. But I think you bring up a ridiculously good point, which was you know when you're st starting your job, knowing what you want in the first place. I mean, being able to walk through a house and say, okay, I, this is everything I need. I need this tile and this square footage of tile. You know, I need this cabinets. I need this, you know, these appliances. I need this flooring and having at least knowing what you want up front. That's going to be a nightmare. I mean, there is, you deal with this on the homeowner side all the time. I would imagine that that's probably the hardest piece is them picking out materials and, 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 and dealing with that headache, right? <laughs> Uh, may, may I interject? I disagree in some of the items that okay. one of them um, is 
having the homeowner pick up the uh, material, I, I completely against it. And reason being, it turned out to be defective or have some problems. And that's the, the uh, that's the loophole that the contractor is going to use to against you that you supply the material. Uh, you show up if the light is not working because mm -hmm. it's, my workmanship was right and it comes back and whatever he has does, he's going to charge you extra because of the 20% markup that you're trying to save. That's one thing. Um, uh, yeah, um, I think the investor needs to get educated. Interview half a dozen contractors. Get to the bottom of it, the bottom of the things. Line items by line items. Understand it. Watch TV. There's uh, Google, YouTube. Watch it. Uh, you, you, as you said, your your first investment becomes your education. You can watch every step of the way. Get educated before you jump the gun. Hiring a professional to help them is a, as a project manager or architect or partner up with somebody a GC. That would be, I think, it would be a great thing uh, to do. Okay. Um, yeah, I can. It, it would be a great asset. You learn, and um, it's, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. I, I can definitely understand, you know, the pros and cons of buying your own materials and things like that. If you're inexperienced, I can see where the contractors could use that as an out to basically go through and say, hey, that's not my fault. You know, you bought crappy materials or something along those lines. I think it's important when you, if you're going to buy your own materials to make sure that you talk with your general contractor in detail about all those things and set those expectations up front. You know, even if material is, is purchased, you know, by them. But like you said, the line item by line item approach will definitely solve a lot of those issues because you can specifically point out the materials and the cost of those materials and then educate yourself enough as an investor or homeowner to know that that's good pricing on the materials specifically and not something that's, you know, you know, out of, out of line, you know? Um, but, but I mean, I, I get my own materials mostly because we have contractors over and over and over again. Um, and we do so much volume that, it's necessary at that time for us to control it because we have so many um, extra materials from jobs that we use on the next jobs and we have really, really good inventory control. So, you know, we see the pros of doing that from a larger scale, but I can definitely understand where, you know, contractors could use that as an excuse to get out, especially a new one that you're not used to working with, you know, that could have that problem. And I think it's important to have a contractor, like you're saying, that will go through this with you and, you know, um, and share with you what they know and be able to even buy everything and take care of it, but at the same time, line it out with you in detail so that, you know, everyone's on the same page with everything. So, which kind of, kind of brings me to contracts and things like that. Darius, have you dealt with people with, uh, have you, have you signed contracts with people on jobs before and, and what are typically in those contracts that you have? I have a 10 page contract. Okay. It's very specific. First of all, we are in California. We are uh, we need to go with the contractors licensing board recommendation. Uh, certain uh, funds needs to be used for certain uh, sentences. Uh, we can upfront charge maybe thousand dollars deposit, and it's a very well orchestrated. And over thirty five years, we have experience uh, various experiences uh, with defects and with, with problems. That we, that's going to reflect on our uh, agreement. Some of those are upfront. For example, one of the very common uh, things is plaster, exterior plaster, stucco always cracks. Everyone cracks, is persistent. And uh, if the homeowner doesn't know, uh, it takes, takes, they think it's going to be a, a perfect thing, and down the road they see the hairline, it scares them. So we, we Better be upfront with them and let them know this is what's happening and explain mm -hmm. them, educate them in certain ways. Same thing with a variety of uh, different uh, things. We have a mechanics team. Keep them, keep them, uh, up, keep, keep them posted that if they don't get paid, this is their consequences. This is we're going to put mechanics. Team. This is what's going to happen. Um, so you put that you put that stuff in the contracts then right. the quality disputes uh, what the procedure is going to be to prove whether 
this is a good workmanship or not, what's the process we're going to take. Uh, uh, insurance information. Uh, there is a, a ton of things that uh, 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 it's just not picking up a hammer and taking the wall down and putting the wall up. There is so many other issues uh, accessible to the job site. Uh, who's going to uh, get you uh, if you're renovating? Sometimes the, um, if you do a complete job, who's going to pay for the uh, utilities while the construction is going on? Uh, parking uh, requirements. If you're working in the condominiums, um, uh, condominium. Um, Parking issues. There is so many well, little little things that that adds up uh, quick, and uh, those are part of the uh, part of the, the agreement, contractual agreement that we have. That's what ten pages. Okay. Uh, that contains besides the scope of the work, uh, the detail of the work. There's other things that gets gets put in there. Okay. What, what about yourself? What, what do you put on your contracts? For for uh, contractors with retail clients? Yeah, or, or your investor flippers and things like that. When, or when I guess when you're dealing with an outside contractor or you know one of your subs, what kind of contracts, what do you put in the contract for to make sure everything's clear, to make sure you have you know everything on the table? Right. Okay. So when I'm when I'm doing uh, when I'm acting as pro project manager for another investor, I will bring in subs that I've used on my own projects that I've used and and know mm -hmm. for years. So I've right. got relationships with them. They're going to give me the good pricing. I pass that pricing right on to the customer because okay. I'm, I'm not marking that up. I'm charging them for my project management services. And so in doing so, each one of those subs. So the stucco guy, he's going to have his own contract on his company letterhead and it's going to go over it. I'm going to look at that contract and then I'm going to go over with the homeowner or the, the investor in this case. And I'm going to say, hey, uh, you know, it's missing this. We should make sure it's got, it has this or this timeline. They're, they're asking for six weeks. It really should be four. Uh, I'll, I'll give my input on that and then we'll try and maybe negotiate a price if we need to renegotiate that or the price is good. And we just need to renegotiate terms. So I will help them. But every sub's going to come in with their own contract and I'm going to go over that with the client. Okay. Okay. And then do you get typically, uh, you know, when you're dealing with that kind of stuff, um, near and into the job, do you get lien waivers and things like that from, from people that you pay and do you pay the subs directly or do you typically pay the contractor, you know, and how, how do you handle, I mean, I could imagine it'd be different in different situations. Yeah. Every situation is different, but, uh, in the project management world, then I'm having the investor that's paying each sub directly cause I'm not marking that up there. So they're paying them directly. Okay. Okay, cool. And then, and then, uh, what about insurance? What kind of insurance requirements do you typically put in place? So all of these subcontractors have to be licensed uh, and insured, showing the proof of workers' comp, and uh, then they're good to go. And most of these guys I've been working with for years anyway, so I already have that stuff on file. So it's that's that part's easy for me. Uh, for a new investor who's coming in, you're going to want to ask for workers' compensation insurance. You're going to want to ask for uh, uh, their licensing information, and you're going to want to go to the state contractors board, which is right online, and you can look them up, see if they've had any complaints, anything filed against their license making sure their license is still active you want to investigate that when you're dealing with licensed contractors yeah I, I agree 100 percent because you never know you know they could give you an expired insurance thing or something like that or copy or you know maybe they're not fully licensed anymore or something like that and that could really cost you down the line if, if you need a licensed contractor to do that stuff and and i you know you see that happen constantly where they're like yeah we're licensed and then if you don't check <laughs> you better be yeah. careful. You know, no, no, because so. you're the one that's liable. Right, right. And, you know, one of the other things that I put in contracts, um, especially when I'm dealing with, you know, a smaller job on, on someone's home or something like that, I think it's important. If you're dealing with the same people over and over again, you kind of get a feel for them, so you need less of this. But I try to put, you know, um, uh, incentives for performance and penalties for non-performance, but be very, very conservative on my penalties, meaning – they tell me the job is going to take a month, and I'm like, okay, are you sure? All right, we're going to give you a month and another two weeks, and then after that two weeks, we're going to start charging you $100 a day, but then as a penalty. But if you get it done before a month, I'm going to give you $100 a day too. You know, but And some people have a real hard time with that. They don't like that at all, and especially if you have to do a penalty, 
they hate you. You know, they're like, yeah. you actually are charging me for this, you know? And it's like, dude, I had a guy, we, we did a 19 unit building and um, he was over by like four months. I was like, you're killing me. And I, I tried to basically, I showed him the total bill was like $13,000 to him for his piece. And I cut it down to $3,000 to be really cool with the guy and said, look, I got to charge you something like I cost me more than this in interest and I'm only charging you three. And he almost had a hissy fit and things like that. And like, you know, it was like, I'm going to file a lien and all this. And at that point I'm going, you know, for $13,000, is it worth dealing with this headache? you know, and, and going to court and things like that. So I, I let him uh, huff and puff and brought my attorney involved and things like that over $3,000 just to, just to make him feel it before I said, fine here, you know, deal with it. Cause I didn't want to go deal with the court thing, but you know, if it's a larger job or really big job, then, you know, sometimes, you, you know, you can, re I could have reported him to the, to, you know, to the contractor's board and things like that. It wasn't worth my time dealing with it. And so I happen to do it, but you know, that's a good, you know, a lot of people it's worth their time, you know? To deal with it and, and have that handled, but it's yeah, that's a double-edged sword because it's you, you want to go through with it and, and push things because contractors need to stay on the up and up with this stuff, and if they know you're just going to back down right. eventually. Right. But then there's the, the thing, hey, how much is your time worth? I could be out finding another project that I can make 50 or 100 grand on. Instead, I'm sitting here in court fighting over this $5,000. So you have to weigh one against the other, no question. I, mean, I, I do agree that penalties and, and uh, early finishing early, uh, those bonuses, those are good in certain uh, instances. You have to be careful when you use them. Obviously, with a sub, you say, hey, uh, if the painter, you, you told me it's three weeks and he does it in two and a half, I want to make sure he's not slopping the job, number one, yeah. just to finish the job. And two, and more importantly, I got to make sure that that timeline actually saves me the money that I'm paying him the bonus for. Because yeah. if I'm doing other things like doing cabinetry or I'm doing the stucco on the outside while he's doing paint on the inside, he's not interfering. So if he takes an extra few days, it's not costing me anything because maybe I'm doing stucco or landscape or the driveway or whatever. So you, you do it at the same time as other stuff. So yeah, you have to make sure it lines up. So it's usually probably better with the GC who is in charge of pretty yeah. much everything. And the main thing, all right, GC, it's going to be a five month project. You finish in five. Great. You finish in six. I'm going to start charging you. You finish under five. Here's your, here's your bonus. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think the, the biggest mitigating factor is, you know, um, just like anybody, you most contractors have to find their next job and their next work. And so, you know, you deal with that a lot on, you know, kitchen remodels or something where, you know, a general contractor will take, you know, two months or three months to get a kitchen fully remodeled or something like that. So it should take, you know, three weeks or less or something like that, you know, depending if the homeowner's in the way or not, you know, of course. But, um, right. Well, you know, here, here's a tip that everybody should know regarding contractors and investments in real estate, and I'm sure Darius knows this too. There are three things in uh, in contracting. It's time, it's quality, right, and it's price. Okay, if, a, if you want it done super fast and you want good quality, okay, then it's going to cost you. Right. Okay? If you if you want it done super fast and you don't care about the quality, then yeah, then maybe he can come down on the price. Right, so you got to right. give up one in, in most circumstances, and so you got to keep that in mind. So you can't ask the contractor to come in. I want this job done tomorrow. I want it done like it's a million dollar home, and <laughs> I want to pay a nickel for it. It's not going to happen. Have you dealt with that, Darius? I'm sure you have. Go that go that route. That's awesome. Darius, have you, um, you know, when you're, when you're going through a job initially, when you first start into, say you're going into a brand new renovation job, um, and you know, it's a cookie cutter, three bedroom, two bath house. Um, and, uh, you walk in and you know, everything needs to be gutted. Okay. Everything needs to be replacement or, and done. How, how do you go about, you know, say you walk into the kitchen, how do you go about kind of gauging what that cost is going to be? Because, you know, you don't know the materials yet. Right. And it obviously fully depends on the materials, what this cost is going to be. Do you typically bid labor uh, costs there and try to estimate what your labor is? Or how do you go and price out a job for a, a prospective client? It varies. First of all, location is the key thing. Where the job is. Is uh, Hollywood Hills uh, that we did it again? Are we looking something in uh, San Fernando Valley or South Central? Mm -hmm. So 
based on those, we have we have been 35 years experience. We know what it takes to build something in Beverly Hills. And same thing, South Central. They sometimes that's have to make material. That's the materials difference. That's the material. And uh, depends on the client. Sometimes you have to uh, wear white gloves to handle the, the whole process. So that's the other uh, process. So based on those initial initial uh, information, location, expectation, we gauge the uh, client, what they expect, their expectations are. And uh, again, those three factors, time, money, we ask them what the budget is. We can go get something custom made, depends on the location, or we can get one of these Chinese cabinet tree. And quality varies from uh, one vendor to another. You can go to get it from HD Supply or you can get it from another vendor that is better, by a bit better quality. Or mix and match. There is, uh, uh, and generally for the kitchen, it, and it can range anywhere from fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to hundred thousand dollars or even more, depending on the size. Whether they're going to be locating with the fixtures. All those comes to the to come to play. One thing you need to take in consideration is uh, check the electrical panels, check the plumbing, mm -hmm. see how updated they they are. Maybe the uh, you want to renovate the kitchen. We pull, we, on my end, I always pull a permit, and for that reason, I know the code requires so many circuits, and we need to have a new sub panel or main panel but it can handle it those are added costs but we that's the range we engage the clients with those range and see where they where they are if they are at the bottom of the barrel that's something else maybe I don't touch them in the job but anyway um, there is always an element of surprise mm -hmm. uh, tell them whatever I tell you I want you to pad it 20, 25, 30%. That's a safe to be under if it happens. At least you are covered. And if it doesn't happen, that's your saving. And mm -hmm. same thing with the bathroom remodels. We know the range of cost. Um, so so if, you're, if you're going through, if you're going through and say you're dealing with a, um, you know, San Fernando Valley house that is, you know, a normal middle house, class house, maybe not Compton, maybe not, you know, Hollywood Hills, but a normal middle class house. You know, I would think that you may not be getting custom cabinets and all that kind of stuff. If you're looking at a flip, you're probably looking at, you know, normal basic materials, but nicer, you know, nice, nice quality, but not highest quality jobs. You know, um, what are we talking about as far as, you know, you mentioned it could be 15000 to 100000 and you know, for a kitchen, which 100,000 kitchens, like custom everything, you know, type of stuff, you know, as well. But when you're dealing with, you know, non-custom stuff, maybe it's a little nicer from than Home Depot, but one of those companies that goes and draws everything out for you in the kitchen and all that stuff and, you know, get some decent, um, uh, decent countertops, you know, that are granite countertops, but not the highest quality stuff, you know. Oh, I mean, what is a gauge for, like, say, a kitchen remodel, a bathroom remodel, um, you know, as far as pricing goes, um, for that type of a house, I mean, we still looking at 15,000 bucks to 20,000 bucks for something like that for a full kitchen. Um, and then a bathroom, you know, what are we looking at? Like, you know, 5,000, 3,000, what do you normally see? When we work the job, as I said, location access, those are the key. We have to give them a range initially. We looking, let's say I walk in, I say, it feels like we have done, I don't know a dozen uh, kitchen a month or uh, within the six months period. So we have a good gauge of what the costs are. Mm -hmm. so let the homeowner know this is the range between 15 to 20,000. If it's okay. if you you're feel comfortable with it, we take the next stage and we narrow it down the quality and so on and so forth. But if they not, if they, they feel it's too high, then we offer them something best to give them the, the, the choices of material or be very specific what it's going to be okay. and from there. Basically say you can come down and things like that. Okay. Right. Um, Will, I know you do a lot of higher end jobs, so it's it's hard to gauge, you know, on the, you know, depending on the property. Um, how do you go out and you 
price a job initially, say it's one of your own flips, okay, instead of from the construction side, how do you go, go about walk, doing a walkthrough and saying, this kitchen is going to be 25000 or this bathroom is going to be ten, or how, how do you kind of come up with that? I know it's experience, but it's also, you know, um, it's also more of an art as well, you know? Yeah, it, it, it is mostly experience. That There's less art there. It is more, more mostly experience. So if I'm going to go into, let's say, a, a house in Van Nuys in the middle of the San Fernando Valley, it's a 3 to 1,500 square foot, your, your cookie cutter house. I don't need to go super, super high end. But in today's market, like right now today, everything right now is selling high. The market is good. It's a it's a great seller's market. Everyone's expecting to walk into a house and have just bring their toothbrush. That's what they're looking for, for as far as buyers. So as an investor, I want to put top-notch stuff in there that looks top-notch. It doesn't have to cost a fortune, but I want it to look super nice, maybe on the modern side. So I know if I'm going to do a 10-foot by 14 foot standard L kitchen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do sh white shaker cabinets and gray quartz stone countertops uh, with the glass tile backsplash and your standard, you know, maybe stainless steel G profiles that you can pick up at Home Depot or, or, or anywhere for that matter, Pacific Sales. I know that that kitchen is probably going to cost me anywhere between 8 and 12, depending on uh, certain items I pick out. So I know that I can do that kitchen for that price in that in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. I can get into even higher range stuff. Um, I can use the same exact shaker cabinets because they're quality. Even whether I use a five hundred thousand dollar house exit or it's a one point two, that that cabinetry it's the same quality because it's it's good solid wood mm -hmm. uh, quality cabinetry. And I'm always using quartz stone. Quartz stone is in. Granite is out. It ground. Granite is just old school now. Uh, unless yeah, our house. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's it, everyone wants everyone wants Caesar Stone or Quartz Stone, and it's 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 fairly inexpensive now. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll go in there and on a high end home, maybe I'll do a waterfall on an island, which is I mean, you have your island, your L kitchen, and then you got an island, and the waterfall is where the countertop goes across and then sweeps down the side and touches the floor. That's called a waterfall. Okay. So I'll add those little extra touches to it. Um, we'll do more higher end. Uh, appliances. Maybe we'll do a built-in 42-inch wide refrigerator instead of the standard slide-in refrigerators. Mm -hmm. Things of that nature. If you're getting up in the in the price yeah, range, okay. exactly. Uh, in a bathroom, I can gut, uh, do a full gut bathroom on a standard hall bath and do it. You know, somewhere between five and eight thousand dollars is going to cost me. Uh, if I'm in the master, obviously maybe I've got the shower and the tub. It's going to be a little bit more. I've got glass enclosures now and everything else, so that. I allow for that, but I can literally walk through a house and say, okay, it's, I know what the area is, like Darius says, you got to know your area, know what it needs. I know because I've done the kitchen so many times, I've done the bathroom so many times, I've done the demo so many times. Mm -hmm. I know what everything costs, I just have it in my head. I can walk through and say, yeah, this is a $100,000 rehab. Uh, Will, uh, yes, sir. sorry to interrupt, don't say the, the bathroom costs, it costs you 8000 but then everybody expects you to Pass that thing to them. No, it's not five thousand. Yeah, no, he's making a good point, and that, that's good to say. These numbers I'm throwing out, these are my costs. And again, as as a contractor, I'm getting things at cost. This is without GC markup. This is without. This is me as a project manager. There's another twenty percent savings there. So yeah, these are these are things that I can do for myself that. You know, right. a, a rookie investor isn't going to be able to afford. But right. long, the point is, know your costs. So if my cost is six to do this bathroom and it's going to cost you nine, then you know your your bathroom is going to cost you nine. You walk through a house; it's got two bathrooms. There's eighteen grand. You got fifteen in your kitchen. You start adding it up. You got X amount of square foot in flooring. You got this much paint, et cetera, et cetera. One quick tip: uh, something I've learned over the years. I have I always underestimated the cost of demo. And demo work, especially if you're getting on an older house, you'll get into a house built in the 50s. You're like, all right, I'm going to demo out this wall or we're going we're gonna to have to get rid of all the drywall on here. And you start pulling it down and guess what? It's not drywall. It's plaster. Guess how heavy that sucker is. You're bringing low boy after low boy after low boy just to demo all the drywall, which is plaster in the house. It costs a fortune to bring all those low boys. I have four and a quarter for every dumpster plus the labor to, to yeah. uh, demo it and load the dumpster, haul it away, and get in the new one. So you definitely want to make sure when you're looking at houses and you're newer, 
check the drywall. Make sure it's drywall or make sure it, if it's plaster because those older houses often have plaster and you'll really run into some problems there. That and the other big ticket items, your HVAC, your electrical, your foundation, your roof, um, and your plumbing. Those, those are the big ticket items, and that's where you really want to have a professional in there inspecting it. And I always, I mean, it's, it cost me 100 bucks to get a termite inspection on a standard size house. Get a termite inspection. Whether whether it does or doesn't have termites, the point is, it only costs you 100 bucks. A good termite inspector is going to find other things if he's crawling under the house, if it's an elevated foundation. He's going to find maybe some foundation issues there for you. Hey, there's, there's a free piece of advice practically. If you do have some termites, don't let that scare you. They're easy to fix and use it as a negotiating t tool to retrade the price if need be, if it's a major item. It's a, it's a legitimate retrade, retradable item. So uh, def definitely investigate the big ticket items when you're one looking thing, at properties. One thing, you, you're absolutely right as far as the demo. Recently, I've been dealing with the management company. I have, uh, we had, after the, uh, Rainstorms, we have a lot of rain damage and plaster repair works. And something I was kind of surprised to see asbestos in drywall. I know asbestos in plaster and needs to be tested. And if uh, drywall, that was something new to me. And that costs a fortune. And yeah. if you demoing those plastered houses and they have asbestos, forget it. It's the land is not even worth it. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, you talk about the, the the plaster. We just we just bought our house, and it was a nine uh, eleven hundred square foot house. We had a nine hundred square feet, but the entire existing house was plaster. So we're like, we might as well take it down to the studs, anyways. We're already adding all this square footage, and we just put all brand new electrical and plumbing in there. But you know, it also had the popcorn ceiling. That's a you know a ton of labor time right there just with that. So they're like. Instead of scraping it, they're just like, let's just take it out because there's no reason to, to keep it. Let's just get rid of it all, you know? But like you said, it's dumpster, dumpster after dumpster. And it's funny, Darius, you brought up the, the cracking of the, the plaster outside because we, we saw that on our new house. And I had no idea that it was supposed to crack before we do our rehabs. And I was like, wait, there's cracks in my, in my, in my, in my siding. What's going on here? I'm calling the contractor. And he's like, yeah, that's normal. I'm like, I don't know if I believe you or not. You know, yeah. <laughs> so then you got to go and check and ask somebody else to make yeah. sure. Go Google it and be like, "Is that right?" You know. So, so but um, but on our jobs because we do so many out there and they're all rentals, so they're very cookie cutter. You know, um, you know most of our stuff. You know, we have different ages of homes in different areas as well. But at the same time, uh, you know, we we have a very cookie cutter system, and we've been able to do it because we're doing about ten a month, and they're much smaller price point homes than what you guys are dealing with out here. Um, but we have it now where all we, we literally have a line by line item job a room by room and then we have all the SKU numbers from our Lowe's, Lowe's corporate account flow right into it and we get the square footage of the whole like every room of the house and try to calculate what we think the materials are going to cost and then we also say okay we calculated what we think the labor costs too to be able to say okay you know what every light switch takes 15 minutes to do that's x amount of labor cost you know and then we go through and we take that number and we get a, a full labor estimate but by vendor right you can't just include the hvac guy or whatever you know like or the plumber it's different people that are doing those things and then we separate it out but you know it's all an estimate right it's all just a, a, an estimate we can be over and under like anybody else but we put you know we go through and put those buffers in place uh, in, so that that way that doesn't happen, which I think is probably the biggest important thing when you're dealing with construction is you never ever do a job without buffers, you know, without having something because there's going to be something that comes up that's unexpected. And I think that's, you know, important to understand. And you also have overages of materials where you need one of something and they come in packs of 10 and then you're going, well, what do we do? And that's why we do the way we do it is because we have, you know, a warehouse of our stuff that we're just like, okay, we got more of that. When the contractor tells us he needs something, we're like, we got some more of that. It's in our QuickBooks where we have, you know, inventory controls and things like that in place. But that's because we're doing the same thing over and over again. It's not that easy when you're doing, you know, a flip on the open market that's totally different than any other job you've done, you know? So. Yeah, those are good examples of scaling up. So that's, that's going from rookie investor and flipping one, 
and then selling it and going to your next one to where you're doing multiple projects at a time you're trying to scale up you've got to implement systems like you're saying you have to have systems if you're going to scale up and how do you guys when you guys are dealing with these materials overages and stuff like that you know do you, you guys use that material for your next job or how do you guys kind of try to save, give yourself some savings on those items well for me uh, I have most of the homes I'm doing, I'm every home's different. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change the tile. I'm not just doing a cookie cutter like back in the day where I was using the stuff. I can use the same tile, the same this, the same that, the same uh, vanity from Lowe's or Home Depot. In these houses, I make every house look a little bit different, so it looks custom because it needs to be. Okay. Uh, so. But that being said, I'll have extra two by fours and, and two by tens. I'll have extra metal straps. I'll have uh, overages of paint buckets. The paint is always the same color in, in a majority of my interior of my homes because I'm doing these modern looks. So I just take those materials, extra insulation, and I'll just take it right over to the next job site. Okay. What about you, Gary? It goes right into there. Very similar. Uh, if I do my own projects, uh, Every one of them is different. Uh, my wife is an interior designer, so she comes with a different okay. I, uh, every single time. And as far as yeah, the common stuff that you may save, some hardware, lumber, that the kit gets transferred. And unfortunately, we don't have an accounting background like you to keep track of all this. <laughs> I, I didn't even do it. I got lucky. I found somebody that had an accounting background and new construction. I'm like, how do you win it? Like, how do you lose there? You know what I mean? So it's like, sweet. Okay. He, he makes our contractors go to a different Lowe's because the sales tax is a quarter percent cheaper. I, I'm in love with this guy. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, so, you know, granted, sometimes that's going too far, but you know what I mean? Not so time. it's fucking labor, but you know. Does he allow beer time for those contractors? No, they just, they, we use them on every job. Like, I mean, we have three or four contractors that we're just constantly using, but you know, we have procedures where it's follow up after the job's done. We do walkthroughs. They understand what we want. We set that expectation up front, which I think, you know, is really important. You know, Darius, when you're managing a lot of subs, how often do you check in with them? How often are you at the job? How do you manage them and hold them accountable? You know, when, you know, they screw up or, you know, they, they show up and they, they don't do a good job or whatever. How do you handle that? If you do not have a full supervision, you are screwed. You need either have a full time yourself or your subcontractor or be somebody that, as Will says, that you have been working on 20 projects and they know you exactly, you know your expectations. And uh, these days, it has become a bit more easier. You cannot be on the job site, but we can video conference it and resolve some of the questions. But being in the field is the most important thing. Okay. So you're consistently on each job you're doing? I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm, I'm at my job site literally just about every day. There's very few days that I'm not at a job site. And if I'm not personally at a job site, then somebody that's working for me is at the job site or uh, somebody that I trust is there that can check on it. But for the most part, 95% of the time, I'm there every day. Uh, your, your job varies from uh, Santa Clarita Valley to San Fernando Valley to your, to Beverly Hills. You're all, all over. My, my, the only way I make it successful is to have my, all my jobs within certain radius. So that's why I barely go to San Fernando Valley. I just trip to West LA with some somewhere I can be between the next job between 20, 30 minutes at the most. Uh -huh. I can manage running 10, 15 jobs simultaneously, but all in done between a few miles of one another. But you're hitting them every day, so you have that, that touch on them, the expectation. Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm pretty much within that range as well, that 30-minute drive. I live in Santa Clarita, so i got to come down to the valley. And, you know, between Echo Park, right, Dodger Stadium, or over to Sherman Oaks, I mean, it's it's literally 12 minutes So between okay. those two job sites. So I'm, I'm, I am, I'm within that range as well. Okay. Um, 
how, how do you guys go about finding new contractors? We had a question here when they're out of state. How do you find new new contractors? I, I think it relates to any market really that you're working in. You know, if it's out of state, you still probably need, in addition to a GC, you you need you know that project manager that's looking out for you as well on every job. You know, um, and uh, as, more importantly, out of state to have that person to be a different person than your GC. You know, as well, that's kind of monitoring the situation. But how, how do you guys go about finding new subs and things like that? Because I'm assuming that you know you go through cycles. Sometimes you use the same guys over and over again, but there's always going to be guys that you know fall off every once in a while. And then do you try to look for referrals. Do you look at Yelp? Like, what what are things that you guys do when you're trying to find new people? For me, I look for uh, number one would be referrals. Number two, I contact suppliers, supply houses. If it's a painter I need, I call up a few painting companies that in the area that I'm feeling comfortable with. Ask uh-huh. them to get some recommendations. And that's basically, that would be a start. Uh, at one time, I thought general contractors and other general contractors are this competition. You don't talk to them. But I learned it's the other way around. You should cooperate and pass on the, the uh, subcontractors and things like that. So that, that was come to play. Okay, interesting. What about yourself, Will? Pretty much identical. Referrals is number one. I always ask for referrals uh, to other contractors. So, for instance, I was looking for another uh, rough framer. And so I asked my drywall guy, hey, do you know any rough framers? He pops one over. I try him out. Uh, he's on the job site for a week or two and boom, now he's with me. He's been with me for a while. So those kind of referrals and asking other investors, um, supply houses if you're in home depot and you've made a good relationship with your pro desk associate there and you ask him hey listen i'm i'm looking for a really good painting crew uh you i'm sure you got painters coming through here who have you seen who would you recommend for this area and ask, ask your supplier so that that's probably a very good start for you awesome great and um and when when you guys when you guys are vetting them and things like that do you do background checks or anything like that on them or how do you kind of get them started and test them because you know that's a scary job you can't just say well here's a you know twenty thousand dollar paint job that i need you to do you know or something like that how do you get kind of get them started to get their feet wet so that you don't take too much of a risk with a specific contractor first of all for me it's very to job to job is it if it's an owner occupied i need to get somebody that is reputable that i've worked with in the past i don't just want to hire somebody off the or of the recommendation. So that's a critical thing. If okay. it's a vacant piece of property, that's different animal. And um, as far as a background check, honestly, 35 years, I have not checked anybody. I okay. Uh, but so far, I've been lucky. <laughs> hear, that wood, hear that wood knock. <laughs> that's awesome. What, what about yourself, Will? Do you do... You do uh, that kind of stuff too, or uh, I don't. I've never done a, like a criminal background check or anything. I guess it probably wouldn't hurt, but it's one extra step I've never felt um, the need to do. Not, okay. not to say that maybe you might want to start doing that, especially if you're new, just to play it safe uh, if you can get that contact. But I have not. So basically, like Darius said, I'm not going to take uh, some new one that was just referred to me and send them over to some retail client where I'm going to rebottle their bathroom, I'm not going to use them on that. I'm going to bring them on to my job site, I'm going to try them on, and I'm going to give them a small piece, and I'm going to say, listen, this is who I am, and this is what I do, and you do a good job for me, I'm going to do a good job for you, and my good job for you is I'm going to keep you employed. I'm going to keep you coming back and back for job after job after job. Now, if you're brand new, you can't say that to them because you don't have my experience. So it's a lot more difficult, not a little bit more difficult, a lot more difficult for the newbie investor to make that jump. So what I would suggest is uh, getting as many of these subs together and having a, a backup. Make sure if you're looking for a painting crew, make sure you're talking to several and you got the one you like the most, keep that secondary one right behind in case that first one doesn't work out and you can bring them in. Yeah, I found I found, you know, the leverage is important. Either you have a ton of jobs going where you can keep the good guys, you know, going and with you consistently. Because And what's hard is that if you don't have those good guys, if you don't have that, that you know, consistent supply happening, then 
you know, the good guys are going to fall off and go find other work, you know, and that's, yeah. you know, they no don't, they, they're not available anymore, you know. It's and hard so, to keep the good guys, and in this market, they want more and more money, too, and mm-hmm. things are getting tighter for all of us. Wait till the crash happens, and then they'll be begging again for more and more work. Exactly. So, <laughs> exactly. That's, when, that's when we as investors come in and just pounce, you know, so, um, yeah. but, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, at the other side, like you said, um, the other leverage, I think, um, is is being able to go through and have multiple contractors because I found if you're using the same guys over and over again and you really need that guy, um, then you know what happens yeah. is over time they know this, so their prices start to creep, their time starts to creep, the quality starts to go down. Sometimes, not all the time, you know, or one of the three starts to happen, and it's it's amazingly powerful to be able to go through and then say. Okay, well, yeah, sorry, man, you didn't get that job. I got these guys over here that, you know, came in better. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for you to finish yours first because we've been having problems with you finalizing or, you know, whatever it is, you know, you have that kind of leverage involved. And I think that helps a lot with, you know, different contractors. Now, if you're good, you know, of course, you're going to go with the highest price, you know, like the most money you can make if you're a contractor, you know. So, of course, and, and, and also look at that consistency, you know, of work, too. So, because that's yeah. huge for, for, you know, being able to set up systems. So, um, so thank you guys so much for, for joining us today. Can you guys, uh, Will, can you talk about um, a little bit about um, how people can get in touch with you and, and, you know, how you help investors out, man? Certainly. So, you can get a hold of me by emailing me. I'm at info, I-N-F-O, at bernardenterprises.com. That's B-A-R-N-A-R-D. Enterprises is spelled out in plural. That's E N T E R P R I S E S dot com. And you can also find me all over Bigger Pockets. If you're a Bigger Pockets member, I'm all over there as well, Matt. And um, you've been doing that for a while, man. You got a lot of education yeah, out there. That's cool. I've, I've, I've done a lot. I've been interviewed on the podcast, podcast there twice, and maybe hopefully a third, third time here soon. I'm going up to San Jose next week to speak uh, to a bunch of uh, members up there, and uh, and then again for the Bigger Pocket Summit, which is up in San Francisco. That's in I think it's October. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll be up there. As you're well. coming to our Phoebe group too in, in Manhattan Beach pretty soon as well, I believe. So. Exactly. So definitely, if you want to meet up with me in person, definitely attend that because I'll be there. And if, uh, if you guys want, you guys well. I'll, I'll let Darius, Darius, I'd love to hear uh, how do people get in touch with you and, you know, work with you and and how do you work with investors or um, people that need your services? I'd be more than happy to consult with them. Um, And it's uh, it's a takes two to tango. We need to, um, it's the uh, beginning investors, one story with somebody experienced, it's another, uh, I, I love to joint venture. Uh, as well, I can be reached at uh, 310-888-4014 or dan at newchoicecontractors.com. Cool. Thanks. And if anybody's interested in learning more about additional education, um, we do these webinars on a consistent basis just to teach and help people out as best we can. Uh, at the same time, you know, we get some great relationships out of it. So if you're ever interested in working with us in any way, please feel free to reach out. You can reach us at ocgproperties.com uh, or e- email us at invest at ocgproperties.com. Uh, at the same time, you can see us at our Phoebe groups. Um, if you go to meetup.com, you type in FIBI, and you'll find our different chapters throughout Southern California. And our whole basis behind that is just teaching with no sales pitch. Um, you know, and you know, it's it's a great place to learn. We have tons of different topics consistently uh, that we go over, and it's a great place to network as well. Afterwards, we do different you know meals and things like that too with people and just networking sessions. So, um, thank you guys very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Will Darius, you guys are awesome. Love talking to you guys about this stuff and higher level individuals when it comes to construction and, and real estate investing. So, uh, thank you guys very much. We'll talk soon. All right. All right. Thanks for having us, Matt. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.